Back to the book of Acts. We've completed the first three chapters and we're starting into chapter number, number four. And we're looking at, as we saw, as we just sang, is Jesus the name above all names. We're looking at the, the climax of this chapter is in the 12th verse. There's none other name under heaven by which a man must be saved. The name of Jesus. But we're going to look at it from, from verse number one, and we see the first thing that happens is because of the work of Jesus Christ that Peter and John are put into jail. That's your reward. Again, I, I always joke around about people having their best life now. That exactly wasn't happening with them, was it? For the name of Jesus Christ, they would be confronted by the council by the Sadducees and, and the captain of the, the guard of the temple and they would be just thrown in jail because of the name of Jesus. Those things await the person who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. We, don't, we try to think that everything's going to be, uh, be a bed of roses in this life, but ultimately they won't be. Anybody that's ever given you a promise that if you trust Jesus as Savior, Everything's now going to go great in your life. They have another thing coming. Things might get even worse in our physical states. Did you say might? <laughs> All right. It's, this too will pass. That's the good news. That's the bad news as well. Things will get worse at one point. We don't know when that point will be but things will get worse. You know that even today, right here in our congregation, right here in the streets around us, somebody is next. Somebody will have something happen to them that's going to be climatic or dramatic or, or, or losing a life. It's just the, the nature is. Somebody's next in line. I don't know who it could be. It could be somebody old. It could be somebody young. It could be something that happens. It could be a, a debilitating disease that's suddenly diagnosed. But somebody is next. And that's because of the nature that we have been given. Or not been given, we've gotten it through the sin of Adam. So that's the reality that we have today. I could walk out the door, step out there, step out in the street, and one of these manure trucks could run me over. That's a possibility. We don't know. We could go, walk out the door of our house in the morning, say good, good, goodbye for the day, and it, sometimes it could very well be our last time we say goodbye to, to our loved ones. We don't know. So the only security that a believer has, or that anybody has, is that name that's above every other name. The name of Jesus. Knowing that one day, one day, it could be today, be in the presence of Him for eternity. That's our only hope, our only comfort that we have. So at that, let's, let's open to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter number 4. And we'll, we'll read through the entire book and, and start with verses 1 through, through 14 today. And I know you're saying, yeah, right. <laughs> but well, let's read the entire chapter. Acts chapter 4. And as they, as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name 
have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even to him doeth this man, or doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all, to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor re or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. Amen. For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, uh, all that is in them is, who by the mouth of Thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever they, uh, thy hand and thy, thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by thy name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any, any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the, pri the prices of the things that were, were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph by the, by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted 
the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Lord, we just pray that You would add Your blessing unto Your holy word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. What a, what a chapter that is. And just pointing out that this miracle that had been done, they could not deny it. It was a known fact. It wasn't just a psychosomatic trauma that the, the lame man was healed. This was right in their face. This man really was healed. Now what do they do with it? We can deny it happened or pretend that it would just go away. And that's ultimately what they did, did later on in, in chapter 5. They would say, well, this, if this is of God, it's going to continue. If this movement, is a key word, movement, today the Christian church is not a movement. The scribes and Pharisees believed that this was another movement that was going on, and it would just disappear like other movements of men would do, but it wasn't. This was the church, or would become the church, that God would establish that would never be, uh, never go away. The gates of hell could not, could not come against the church as it was being formed in the book of Acts. So we go on here, we look at Peter. Now I'm going to change, I'm going to change uh, up here to back to my uh, electronic stuff. <laughs> and my vision's not as good as I thought it was, so I was testing myself. So, back to the healing of the lame man. It was something that could not be denied. It was right there before all. The crowd had come. They had heard the message that Peter had preached. And we have now up to 5,000 saved. Remember, it started out as at 120 in Acts chapter 1. That went to 3,000 in Acts chapter 2. And now it's up to 5,000 people believing the message that Peter had. What, a, what an amazing thing that is right there. That in spite of the opposition by the, the council, by the, the religious leaders of their day, people still believed even with their threatenings, which, which is where we're getting to today. We have Peter and John's arrest in verses 1 through 4. Now let's look at verse number 1. Uh, who did the arresting? It was the council. That's what they called in chapter 5. This council, or members of the Sanhedrin, and this council was compro composed or comprised of the priests, temple officials, or guards, and the Sadducees, here in verse number 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, that word came upon them, uh, where it says that is they weren't coming to ask them if they wanted to share a cookie with them. They were coming with indignation. They weren't being snackified. <laughs> they were coming with, with, with anger to them, to confront them. Because after all, the Sadducees, if we were to look at the, the history of the Sadducees, they denied the resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And here's Peter. What's he preaching about? The resurrection. And what's he going to do in a few verses later? He's going to turn around in spite of what they're saying. He's going to preach the resurrection. This notable, most notable miracle of all was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The most attested to miracle ever in the history of mankind. We have God's proof on that. So it was this council that came. The Sadducees, uh, the Sadducees were there, and uh, they were formed. We have these two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Before the Babylonian captivity, there were no such groups. These two groups were, uh, uh, got together after. The Sadducees were named after somebody named Zadok, not the high priest Zadok from David, but after, after a gentleman uh, in about 170 B.C., 
and they were wealthy. They were the, the, the highfalutin, uh, rich people of the day, and they were conservative politically. They were all for the nation and building up the nation. And, and doctrinally, they, dis, they disputed with the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees were very religious as well. The Sadducees were pragmatic, the Pharisees were religious. And by religious, the Pharisees, they denied much of the uh, spiritual aspects of the law, and they added their own laws to it. They went more by their own oral tradition than they did by the actual Word of God. And, and we see that, the fruit of them, still with us today. See, people have it opposite. I get called a Pharisee by people. You're a Pharisee. You say it's all by Jesus. You're a narrow-minded Pharisee. I, try, I have to correct them. Say, no, a Pharisee is one like you who think there's all kinds of other man-made doctrines that you need to know Jesus. So most of, the, most of the critics that you see around that want to call somebody that's a fundamental critic, uh, critic, yeah, a fundamental Christian, a Pharisee, are indeed Pharisees. They heap upon themselves doctrines of men and things that come out of the most outrageous places as for being of God. That is truly Pharisaical. They use the tradition of the elders and the oral traditions on top of the law of God. That's the difference between the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees. They, they, even though the Pharisees believed in a resurrection, the Sadducees didn't believe anything like that. They didn't believe the resurrection. They were pragmatic. They were all about furthering the goals of the nation. So they weren't in existence until after the return from Babylon. So they're relatively new. They were, they were a new group, two new groups that were together. And among all those, we have this, this council, the Sanhedrin, that was made up of a lot of, a lot of uh, temple officials, priests, and also they had, they had the Sadducees all involved. And this is who Peter is being, being Peter and John are being arrested by. So that's verse number one. Verse number two says, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That was the greatest sin, according to the, the, the Sadducees, they could have, this resurrection of the dead because they didn't believe in it whatsoever. Let's turn over, just for a second, to one chapter over in chapter number 5. And uh, we'll get to this in more detail. Let's go to verse 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Every one that came to, the, to Peter and John, who came to Peter, were healed with the apostolic uh, healing that was given to them. Then, verse number 7, Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So right away, what's the first thing Peter and John do between chapter 4, verse 1, and now, first thing they do, they were commanded not to teach in the name of Jesus again. What did they do? They went right back out and obeyed God's command for them to go. And they taught the resurrection. And hence, they were thrown in jail once again and will save the miracle at the end of chapter 5 for later, which was, was, there, was Peter's deliverance from that jail. It's amazing the things. When we look at chapter 5 going on, you can tell that these things don't happen today. They were for a period of time, like Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5. That doesn't take place today, does it? 
God could strike any one of us dead at, at one time, but it's not a, norm, a normative thing that takes place in a church setting, and neither were the positive things that happened before these healings. They were apostolic in nature and meant to verify who Jesus himself was. Let's go over to Acts 13. Just a couple verses in Acts that sets this. Verse number... Verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the Word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So his, this was their pattern that they had. Then, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. This is, the, this is part of the the changeover from Jew to Gentile and, and the body of Christ, the church, taking place. They were rejected. The apostles were continually rejected right through Paul himself. Let's go to ver, uh, chapter 19. Chapter 19 of the book of Acts. Uh, let's go back yeah, this. let's go to verse 17 or verse, verse 16 kind of the ending of the story of this demon possessed person and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and woman and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds." Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent unto Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a, sa for, for a season. And the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. That was the verse I wanted to get to. There was still the critics, the Jews were still stirring up about the way, about the, the Christian way, about the ministry of the apostles. Uh, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the, with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth, Moreover, you see in here that not, uh, that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, 
saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this, this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesian, of the Ephesians, and the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travail and travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were, were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense with the people." But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. Let me stop there just for a second here. So we see that in the Gentile world, they had their very same, they had their gods that now this way was going against. So here was Paul now being warned not to speak any more of the Lord Jesus Christ here. So the same thing is happening with the Gentiles. Oh, dare you go against the gods of the Gentiles. There'll be certain wrath that will happen that will have that will happen to happen. That will happen. <laughs> there'll, there'll, be, there'll be things that will, will have to be paid for. Come on in. Yeah. Welcome. Must be the wind. What verse was I on there? Uh, a verse, verse 36. For, for you have brought, verse 37 now, for you have brought thither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies, let them, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar. There be no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. I like Alexander. He just, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. This is a matter between the Ephesian people and these, these worshippers of, of Diana and the artisans and craftsmen who were making a handsome living off of that idolatry to go to them directly. But here was Paul's rejection, just like Peter's rejection by the Jews. Paul was being rejected by the Gentiles because their message contradicted with their message that they already had believed. Oh, well, sadly today, there are how many places still worship the goddess Diana? They may not do it in name, but they're worshiping other idols that are promoted as gods. They're worshiping gods of the New Age, which are, which are patterned after all these other gods, all in contradiction to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I title, None Other Name Under Heaven by Which a Man Must Be Saved Than Jesus Christ. Now let's, uh, let's turn over to, to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Down to the, uh, the end, this is the, the raising of Lazarus.
going to add some good news to this. We know the we know the story of Lazarus and his resurrection. 43. Yeah, let's yeah let's pick it up at verse thirty nine. Jesus said, "Take ye away the stone." Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, said I, said I not unto you that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I, think, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So here was this miracle again, the living, the, the Jesus Christ alive in the flesh, doing this miracle. Why? So people would see that he was the Messiah. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! I don't know, he was probably much louder than that. But he cried with a loud voice. A cry of, of love and anguish all at the same time. Remember, he had, he had wept when he knew that, that Lazarus was in there. He knew the effects of sin. He knew the effects that, it, that sin would have on all people. And he was able to cry, but here, knowing that Lazarus would be alive, he could shout that out, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Verse number 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But, there's always that but. There's always going to be a, a but in the middle for good or bad. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles." If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, who we've just seen in Acts chapter 4, he is the, the high priest, at the, he was at, at the time, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. I always liked that verse. He prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Did Caiaphas think he was prophesying? God used that, though. He was thinking he was getting rid of a troublemaker. Oh, surely we can, we can get rid of him. He could team up with the Sadducees who don't believe a resurrection, and we can develop a story and a plot line. We, can, we could even say that his, his body was stolen at the resurrection. We can make up a conspiracy to hide who this Jesus is. And not for that nation only, but that also he, he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to, to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples." So we see the plot continues to thicken. We see the, the council together to get rid of Jesus, to have Him crucified comes. And after the resurrection, they even will continue to deny it. And all this took place in one afternoon. What started off as going to the, the temple for the 
the evening prayer then took a turn and this man was healed, this commotion was made, and, and Peter and John would be arrested. And, and something, let's go, back to, let's go back to Acts chapter 4 for a second. Verse number three, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Just like the registry. If you go to the registry and they close at five o'clock, you can be in line there and they'll just close that window. <laughs> Sorry, we're closed. The, the, the council, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, once it hit a certain time, business was done. So let's not even bother to, to, to bring Peter and John. Let's, we got to put them in a hold for the night until the next day when they convene during, at 8 o'clock in the morning, like, like most government officials will, <laughs> will meet. But something interesting here in verse 3, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold. Here's a word that's become a, an evangelical buzzword that I absolutely hate, but I'm going to use it. Intentionality. They were intentional in their taking of Jesus. That, that was their plot. That was their plan. We need to get rid of the story of the Messiah at all costs. Even to the point of sending them to jail on multiple times. So we're there for that one purpose. Verse number, verse number five, four. Howbeit, even in spite of the commotion, even in spite of seeing Peter and John having their, their hands laid upon them, that's a, that's a real hand laying, laying upon of hands. They literally took them, cuffed them, put them in, put them in chains and dragged them off into a holding cell. Even in spite of that, did the people run away? More people believed because of that. How could you argue with this miracle that has taken place? And add to that, how can you argue with the resurrected Christ? The only ones that seemed not to get the idea were those that had an agenda, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The scribes, the Pharisees, they all wanted it their way. And that's what they would continue to strive for. And so this figure, this figure we have in, in verse number 4, so the number of the men was about 5,000. And that's not, I don't believe in, in the different views on this, I don't believe that was 5,000 more on top of the 3,000 before. I believe it's, it shows, Luke is showing a rolling figure. Started out as 120 in the upper room, then 3,000 in Acts 2, and up to 5,000 here in Acts chapter 4. He's showing the progress. In spite of the persecution, in spite of the martyrdom of, that would take place, the message would grow. The love for the Messiah would grow in spite of it. Now we go over to, to verse number 5. Verse number 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were, were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. So we have Annas, who was actually the father-in-law of Caiaphas, but right now Caiaphas is acting as high priest. And uh, John, we, it was Jonathan, who would later become the next high priest. So they go in order. They have their family that's together. Alexander, I don't think anybody knows exactly who this Alexander is. And as many as were of the kindred uh, were together. 
they were gathered together at Jerusalem, and when they had set them in the midst, now here's where you get a picture of being, think of a, a government assembly. If you ever watch like a, a United Nations conference, they all sit in a circle. So they have Peter and John at the front, and they're around in a circle with the, with the highest level leaders up in the front, and then so on and so forth. So they're right in the middle. The spotlight is on them. And it's a spotlight of fear. I always like the, uh, the old uh, crime detective movies where they take the guy and they, they bring him and they put a spotlight over him. They close the door and then, then pretty soon the guy pulls out a pair of pliers and threatens to pull off his fingernails and stuff like that to try to get a confession out of him. This is the same kind of uh, a, a place where this was. They were there. They wanted to make Peter and John afraid. It was a scare attack. They were terrorists. They were the terrorists of the day. Those, those, those Sanhe, that Sanhedrin and those Sadducees, they needed to stop this message at any cost. So they were there to strike fear upon them. They, uh, let's, go, let's go back to, to, to Luke for a second. Here's why they had to, had to stop these guys here. Luke chapter 11, should have gone there earlier. Luke chapter 11, down to verse 14. And he, Jesus, he was casting out a devil and it was dumb. I've never met a smart devil, by the way. <laughs> no, actually, actually, Satan is incredibly smart. And his demons are very smart, so that doesn't go with this. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven, but he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. See, this is what the, the, the religious leaders were saying, that Jesus is healing through the power of of Satan. This was and is the so-called unpardonable sin. Attributing the works of God to Satan, the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judge. If I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are, are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his, spoiled, his spoils. He that is not with me is against me." Uh, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it ex uh, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. See, Jesus' point here, if I am of the devil, and I'm casting out the devil, it's going to be a full cycle that there's going to be just more devils would come in. But I'm stronger than the devil. I'm of God. And if I come in, there's nothing that can unseat me 
from my position. So that's what the Pharisees and the scribes were doing. They were declaring that he was of Satan. I like his words. And if I'm of Satan, who do your sons? What power do they have to cast out? Very good point. Let's go over to, to, what was that, Luke? Let's go over to Matthew 12 for a second. Matthew 12. Same parallel here. Verse And uh, I'm just gonna, I was going to go to verse 22, but let's go down to verse 31. Matthew adds, adds an important thing to this. Verse 31 says, Wherefore, with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come." See, Jesus is saying, you can, you can say all you want against me personally, but against, the, against my Father and against the Spirit that is the one that is doing this work, that will not be forgiven. If you dare credit the work of God with that of Satan, that is the unpardonable sin. Do we have the unpardonable sin today? Well, if we did, it would be simply this. If you reject Jesus Christ, that's the unpardonable sin. Every other thing. You can call Jesus, you can call Jesus names. You can take his name in vain, like many people do. They have they put God's name and then uh, with a water obstructing object at the end. They can do all that. All that is forgivable, but when when one attributes his work. To that of Satan, that is unforgivable. When you put ahead anything else besides Jesus for your salvation and sanctification, that is unforgivable. But there is, a, there is hope, though, because you can deny, drop all that stuff and believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again, and that is the saving message right there. You're totally forgiven. 100% completely forgiven by what Jesus did at the cross. They, they attributed the working of Jesus to Beelzebub. This was still their agenda. Let's go to verse number 8 of Acts chapter 4. And this is, this is actually a, a pretty fascinating verse. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Stop right there for a second. Let's go back to the book of Luke for a second. Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. Verse number 
12. And this is, put Peter's name in verse 12. Don't put your name on here. Put Peter's name, put Paul's name, put Barnabas. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. I see the Apostle Paul all through that. I see that in, in the future of when in the future as well, you know, during during the millennium, before the millennium, during the tribulation. But here's Peter. Put like I said, put his name there, put him in Acts chapter four and chapter five and, and Paul in there in Acts chapter thirteen. Put put them in there. And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, he didn't have his own power, he was given the words to say by the Holy Spirit on that day in Acts chapter 4. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. It was Peter put on the spot. The spotlight was upon him. He had the whole council there wanting him to cower in fear and just go along to get along, but yet being filled with the Holy Ghost, he gave the message, the accusation that would come. Let's, uh, let, let's continue a little bit in here in, in Luke, and it shall, or, or in Luke 21, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by the parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. And I could go further, but I'm going to stop right there. Put that where we just read in Acts chapter 4. Peter, on the spot. Peter would also say in 1 Peter 3.15, later he would say to always be ready to give an answer for the hope which lieth in you. And that we do today through the study of the Word of God. But there was Peter on the spot. And look at what he does. Let's go back to Acts 4. And we'll get ready to close here. Acts chapter 4. <laughs> then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of, of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man. So he's pointing out to them, this is a good deed that was done. This was not bad. This was not a crime that was done. By what means he is made whole. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. Remember Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. With boldness here. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This, verse number 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Peter directly quotes that from, from uh, Psalm 118, Isaiah 8, verse 14, Isaiah 28, 16. Jesus would call Himself that in Luke chapter 20, that He was a stone which the builders rejected. Romans chapter 9, 33, and Paul's testimony to Israel would say the same exact thing. And also, in Peter, once again, in 1 Peter, gives the whole thing about Jesus being that stone. He's now become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those that rejected Him. See, this... this this stone that was rejected, this stone that the cornerstone would be used to hold up the entire building. The cornerstone was the most important part. And there were those builders. This doesn't have the perfection that we need. This stone, this stone's a little blemished. This stone is ugly. 
This stone is not what we were expecting. Let's reject it. But He's the cornerstone. Isaiah 53 said there's no comeliness at all in Him. There's nothing that man would desire in Him. And that is the Messiah. He would be that stone that they would reject. And this very same stone he would, people would stumble over as well. He would be their judge. Their judge and jury to, to bring them into God's judgment for rejecting Him. He was rejected. But we... In the age we're in, we see Jesus, who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels. He was, he was and is God. He was taken. He, he was not pretty. He was not, not handsome to look at, but He bore our sins upon Himself. He bore the nation of Israel's sin upon Himself, and He was rejected. But we are able to receive Him as Savior. He's now the head of the corner. They rejected Him. It's our benefit today that we can receive Him. He is that head of the corner. He's the foundation. He's everything that we need. In verse 12, and I'll close here, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter, talking twofold here. Number one, don't be looking for the nation of Israel. Don't be looking for these conquering heroes that would take over. There's only one that's going to come and establish the kingdom, and it is Jesus. For you Gentiles, or us Gentiles, or we Gentiles, or y'all, there is only one name under heaven by which we must be saved. Buddha cannot save Mohammed cannot save. You cannot save yourself. Hmm? Mary. Mary cannot save. That's right. None of, no one. There's no other name under heaven. This is the name above all names. We sang that song. Beautiful Savior. Glorious Lord. He's the one that died on the cross on our behalf. There's no other way. First Timothy, uh, First Timothy, chapter two. Actually, let's the closing of the closing here. First John. That's where I went, wanted to go. First John, chapter five. Listen to these words. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, he that believeth not God, hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath, I love this word, given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. Oh, I love the King James language right there. Hath. It's already been done. It's accomplished. It's in the past. Hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and, it, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now verse number 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, 
and we are in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. I like the ending. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is no mediator between God and man, but the man Christ Jesus. There is only one way. There's only one name that can deliver. There's only one name that can save. There's only one name that can keep a person saved. And that's Jesus Christ. That's the one name that we need. Amen? That one name. All you have to do is call upon that name. Amen. Say, I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me. And you know what He will? You know what know what will happen? He will. It's an incredible thing. He will in no wise turn anyone back. Once you realize that you're a sinner, you have no other hope except for, for the gospel, no other hope but in that name above all other names, Jesus Christ, that is eternal life right there. Amen? Again, anything, any, anytime anybody has questions or anything about, you know, should I trust? How can I trust Christ? How, how, how can I grow in Christ? Ask. Come to me. I love, it's one thing that I love. I love answering and being challenged on, on questions regarding the Scripture, or God's will, because God has given us His Word so that we may know Him. Amen? God is good, isn't He? Amen? Our Savior is good. Our Savior, the one and only. Don't trust in anything else. Everything else will lead to nowhere but hell. But the name above every other name will lead you right to heaven. Amen.